Hello, everybody. Welcome back. How many of you were here for the Logan Air Talk this morning? OK, good. So, <laughs> excellent. So, um, welcome back to those of you who are here for the Logan Air Talk and a warm welcome to everybody who's uh, here for the first time this morning from Pilot Careers Live. Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Bath. You're not going to hear much from me in this session. You'll be very pleased to hear. I will be moderating the questions that you're submitting. Um, and my colleague here, Anthony Pettiford, who I will ask to introduce himself in just a second, will be picking out the questions and asking our panel to answer them for you. Um, if you've not already done so, please log in to slido.com. Uh, use that participate, participant code and you can then submit your questions for our panel. We've had a lot of questions in already, so if you have a quick browse through those questions that have already been submitted, you can actually <coughs> upvote the question that you'd most like to hear answered in here today. We've had too many to be able to answer in this session, but if your question's a really unique one, then please put it forward, because I'll try and pick it out so that it goes to the top as well. But look out for interesting questions you want to upvote. OK, we will save some questions that are specific for our other airline speakers later. For example, if something comes in about the BA Speedbird Pilot Academy, we will save that for British Airways when they speak later. And all of those answers will be recorded for you to be able to watch online after the event. You'll be sent a link after the show. So this is being recorded and all of our talks are being recorded for you to watch on demand later. Right, that's me. So today our facilitator will be Anthony Pettiford, and I'll let you just briefly introduce yourself. Briefly. Briefly, briefly, briefly. Please. okay. You're very old, so it could take a long time, so keep it neat. <laughs> very. <laughs> uh, greetings, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you here for our question time activity. It is what you make of it, and what the panellists will do their very best to be as provocative and thought provoking and unravel the mystery from the questions. So, Karen asked me to introduce myself. My background is I am, I'm a former shareholder owner of two very famous academies the Oxford Aviation Academy which went to um, CE, and CTC Aviation, which went to L3. So those are represented also at this show today. So that's my background, and hopefully I'll help facilitate the right responses from our guest speakers, Excellent. all of whom are very lovely people. Thank you very so. much, AP. And talking of lovely people, can I ask each of you to introduce yourself, please, panel? Robin first. Hello there. Um, first time. Karaoke normally, I just said to say. Um, <laughs> name's Robin Gibson, head of training for Castle Air. I've been in the industry, what, 30 years? Um, and we're launching a, a, a CPL integrated course this year. So um, it's helicopter orientated. So probably not many of you in here, I'm guessing, but we'll see. So that's what I do. Thank you, Robin. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Carla Booth. I'm the commercial director at Skybourne Airline Academy. Um, I've worked in the industry for 16 years now, and I've worked with and worked for both of these guys. So uh, oh. it's lovely to be amongst familiar faces again, and lovely to see so many new, uh, new, new acquaintances. So welcome to the session. Thanks, Carla. Sheldon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming in. My name is Sheldon England. I'm a commercial pilot and training advisor for an organisation called the Two Fly Aero Group. So this is a global group of aviation training businesses. Um, we focus on delivering professional pilot training fundamentally in the United States um, and in southern Spain. I've been in the industry since 2010. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Whittingham. I'm from Bristol Grand School and from Wings Alliance, and we specialize in modular training. Fantastic. Thank you very much, panel. So we're just about to display the questions on the screen here that have been coming in. And I'm going to hand over to you, AP, and stand off stage, lead you to it. Karen, Enjoy thank you so the much. entertainment, everyone. Splendid. Well, without doubt, and I know from my own experience, COVID was a real challenge. There can be no doubt for the aviation industry, but in fact, for, for many industries, of course. And those challenges clearly have some residual impact and not only for the ATOs, uh, but also for potentially people entering this industry. So starting with the panel, Carla, you look so longingly to answer this question. So Carla, how would you respond to those challenges and how we're dealing with them? Thank you, Anthony. I thought it was coming to me. Um, so I think, as Anthony says, it was a particularly trying time for um, all academies um, and for Skybourne specifically. We were quite new. So uh, we, we launched our first um, integrated programme back in April 2019. So really a, a critical point during uh, the COVID pandemic. So for us, it was uncertain times for sure, but we um, we were we weathered that storm um, as best we could. And I'm glad to say that we've come out thriving and, and used that opportunity um, during the, down the, during the slump, if you like, um, to actually think about our future growth, because we 
we understand the industry. We know that it typically is quite cyclical and these sort of peaks and troughs regularly occur every seven years or so typically is, is mentioned. So we took the opportunity to take stock and to get our heads down, do what we do well, but also think about our growth. Um, and during that time, we were able to acquire our Florida base in Vero Beach, which some people thought probably we were crazy um, for doing during a pandemic. But I'm glad to say that it's paid off hugely and we've gone from strength to strength. Um, Post-COVID, the, the challenge for ATOs is really the uncertainty. So when we came out of that situation, it was understanding how quickly the airlines and therefore the training would, would bounce back. So um, I'm glad to say it was it was swift and, and therefore it meant that we were, uh, we were expanding rapidly. Rapidly and, and able to thankfully keep up with that with that growth uh, and do so safely um, while still maintaining a very high quality product. Thank you, Carla. Robin, do you want to respond on the helicopter side of things? It was a different world. Yeah, it's a um, completely different world. We obviously had the same challenges as everybody else during the pandemic, but um, since the pandemic, we've our industry is secular, like you've said. Um, we're probably, it's different factors that make our industry go up and down. I'd say the helicopter world is very, um, in the UK, is very linked to the oil and gas side. So if the oil price goes up, and I think there's a war going on somewhere um, that has created a, a problem with that, um, the North Sea can never seem to get enough pilots. So they sort of track the oil price. So when it's $20 a barrel, um, they're not taking on pilots. So we're very buoyant at the moment, the industry from the point of view that if you want to a helicopter career and you're going down that side of it, it's good. So post-pandemic, we've really, I'd say the major problem is people funding it themselves is where it doesn't seem to affect us from the school side because we're, in, we're introducing this new integrated course. We've seen that we've been asked to do this basically. Um, we tended to do instrument ratings and twin engine stuff and the higher the further down the line of your career. So we're um, doing this because by quite a few people we've been asked to do it and we've seen an opportunity. Um, but I would say one of the things that pandemic really has to do with is, is the funding. And we're looking at methods of doing this for people to try and assist. But in the helicopter world, sponsorships are few and far between. But there are things that you can do as a company to assist. We're looking at... Um, sponsoring instrument ratings for certain people or flight instructor ratings. But um, our side of it, job-wise, seems very buoyant at the moment. So. And just before we go, challenges in getting employers to back cadets on these programmes, is that a challenge still or is it becoming much easier? I'd say um, from what I've seen, I've been in the industry 30-something years now, um, and I self-funded it myself, I'm not ex-forces or anything. Um, from the helicopter world, the industry changed 2009-11, basically, caused a, a, a change in the helicopter world. Before then, people used to go through so far, and then the expensive things like twin engine and instrument rate in, in helicopters was funded by the oil rigs. Post that, um, a lot of the academies, let's say like Bristol Academy, were one of the few that did this. They were sponsoring people. That stopped. Um, I actually worked for Bristol's and restarted the... Um, was very influential in restarting the academy at Bristow. But there aren't many people that go through that, um, to be truthful. Um, but we've had other North Sea operators approach us who are looking to do this. But I think it is a challenge because you're not talking, in our small world, many cadets. You, you, one offshore operator is probably only going to sponsor six a year. Okay, so, but, but improving, would you say? I would say it's improving because it has to. They've They've... It's going to have to. It's still a challenge because um, it's going to meet a point where there are a lot of experienced people on the offshore, which feeds the onshore industry. Okay. So if you police air ambulance, so it's challenging from that point of view that okay. they're going to have to get... People have got to get proactive in okay. trying to so get the people... necessity in. has become the mother of invention. Carlo, do you agree that, that the airlines are coming back? Yes, I would. Um, so as, as has been mentioned already, so British Airways have been really trailblazers in terms of um, facilitating that funding. Um, we're delighted to be partnering with them and, and I'm having several other conversations with other airlines that have a, a sponsorship flavour. So um, I'm confident that there will be more down the track. Brilliant. So, OK, let's go look at the modular world because that's obviously uh, different. And so both Sheldon and, uh, 
and Alex can give us a different perspective, I think, can't you? Well, so we... We'll try and do that. We promote a full-time course of training in the United States and Spain. Um, and I think I'd rather focus on the consequences of COVID and what it's and um, how that's affected students' abilities to apply for jobs as an airline pilot right now. I don't think there's, in the 14 years that I've been doing this, there's, there's never been a better time to apply for a job as an airline pilot. And I think that's partly due to the consequences of COVID. Uh, and I talk about this a lot at my seminars in the sense that in March 2020, Boris Johnson said, go home and you can stay home for quite a long time. And as a consequence of that, many airline pilots around the world have been fired, they've been laid off, they've been furloughed, or they've been put on a part-time roster. The consequences of doing that for a year and a half has caused a lot of ex highly experienced airline pilots to reevaluate how they want to live the rest of their lives. So we've got, you've got very experienced captains, senior first officers at British Airways, many other airlines around the world. They've, they've, had, they've, had, they've had a new lifestyle forced on them, so they're spending more time in the garden, they've taken up tennis, they've taken up golf, they're spending quality time with the wife or the husband. And then when it comes to coming back to work, a significant percentage of those pilots have opted to take early retirement. Equally, a large percentage of experienced first officers have taken a decision that they want to return to the flight deck, but on a reduced roster. So if you've got one pilot that's saying, I'll come back to British Airways, but I only want 300 hours a year, and the maximum is 900, guess what? That airline all of a sudden needs three pilots. And so I think that this is feeding into the pilot shortage, and not a lot of companies or people talk about this. So of course, this is a benefit to us because we can then promote to, to the world but that there's never been a better time in the 14 years that I've been doing this to apply for a job as an airline pilot. That then feeds negatively into the situation that, applied, that um, uh, appears to be the case for many flight schools. Um, our ability to keep highly skilled and experienced flight instructors, ground instructors and simulator instructors is very difficult because of the airline demand. <laughs> So there's good news and there's bad news. You need to be very careful when it comes to making your selection with regards to who you're going to train with. But the good news is, and I think this, I personally think this is going to be with us for about five years. There's never been a better time to apply for a job as an airline pilot in the 14 years I've been doing this. And Alex, would you concur? <coughs> Rather strangely, I find myself agreeing completely with Sheldon, <laughs> which doesn't often happen. Yeah. Um, but I think he is, <laughs> he is absolutely right that uh, this is the best time I've seen in 20 or 30 years to be applying for a job as a pilot. The problem that he identifies is moving from where you guys are now to applying for a job as a pilot because they're not the same thing. And this is a notoriously cyclical industry. Robin mentioned that it's very cyclical. And as a consequence of the instructors going off to the airlines and because of the cyclical nature of the industry, many of the big schools are completely clogged up now and can't deliver the pilots that the airlines want them to deliver. So the question originally was, what do I see as the biggest problem for the industry? And I see that as the biggest problem for the industry, really. It's a consequence of the cycles that we're in that we can't now deliver the demand. But essentially, I agree with Sheldon. Great. Alex, stay with it. Money. OK, this is going into pilot training is not an inexpensive activity. Funding schemes, getting funding and getting your applications on funding programmes stand out. So we'll consolidate those three questions together. Yeah, there's, about... sorry, Anthony, there's, a, there's like three or four questions that have come in. So rather than, uh, if I just quickly, there's one, ta how are you going to tackle the funding situation for pers prospective students who may not have a house to put up a loan? Where's the best place to find financing options? And are there any long-term financing options, as well as the one that's highlighted up there, that we can perhaps build that into the answer? Yeah. So that whole, how do you stand out getting the funding and funding the solutions in general? So the funding from the airlines was the question? Or, or funding, in fund, funding in general. Funding in general. Yes, that's right. And how do you stand out to get the airline funding? Uh, airline funding is, is sparse. The airlines are starting to make noises, but they haven't really delivered beyond British Airways um, in terms of fully sponsored schemes. There are other schemes out there that require you to pay for it and sort of either guarantee or near guarantee or imply that you're going to get a job afterwards. But to my mind, the only real sponsored scheme is the BA scheme, which, of course, is, is very challenging to get onto 
And if you get onto it, well done. You know, that's a, that's a good thing to have. <coughs> for the rest of us, essentially, we have to pay for our training. And that is a problem because traditionally the money's raised either for people who are working and who train while they're working, which doesn't make it inherently uh, more affordable, but makes it more manageable. Or alternatively, for parents in particular who are sort of looking after uh, youngsters who want to come into the industry, it basically means mum and dad have to stump up. Um, and that is a challenge because there are no funding schemes that I'm aware of that are targeted for pilot training at all. You're basically talking about mortgages, inheritances from, from grandma and stuff like that, um, or savings. Uh, and it's, it's a big shock. And I speak as a parent. Uh, mortgages are high risk, yes, now. Um, it's compounded because uh, some of the, our colleagues in the industry insist on taking money up front. Uh, and this is a big bugbear of mine that you go to a flight school and they say, yeah, give us 100 grand up front. Uh, and there's no reason for it other than they can get away with asking for it. Uh, but unfortunately, that's the way of the world. And uh, as you say, it's high risk because there is always the possibility that one of them might go past. OK, Sheldon, I'll come back to you because I know you've got a comment on that. But Carla, respond to that because Alex has given you the challenge, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has, he has. Um, so I would agree that British Airways absolutely um, is, the, uh, is the primary funding solution that most people in this room probably will consider. Um, and it is highly competitive due to that. Um, but in terms of the payment schedules that Alex touches on, um, I would agree that there are some organisations out there that are asking for huge sums of money up front, which is not something that um, I would ever, well, I would always advise caution uh, when having those types of conversations. Um, something that we do um, for our own integrated courses is we have a payment schedule, so it's very clearly spelt out in terms of five instalments, so there's a deposit element and then, um, and then further um, percentages that you pay throughout the commencement of your training, um, so once you're in progress. And I have to say that we effectively hold your funds in escrow whilst you're in training. So if at any point you were to have to leave your training program with Skybourne, the funds that you have paid to us to date um, are all available and the, any amount that needed to be refunded to you is available to us um, to, to give back directly. Um, we also um, want to share in this financial risk that you are taking and one of the um, uh, USPs of our integrated program is our performance protection whereby um, we effectively it's, it's a type of money back guarantee um, I won't hog the floor with going into the specifics of that now um, but by all means come and speak to me afterwards I'm very happy to do so I'm also doing a seminar presentation later on this afternoon um, and I will go into the details of that so hopefully I'll see some of you um, at, that, at that briefing too so um, hopefully that helps. And Sheldon, yeah, thank you, Carla. That's great. So, uh, Sheldon, you were going to make a comment there. Oh, sorry, Alex, did you want well, to say... On this end of the table, we're quite impressed that you're using escrow accounts because I've never seen any organisation do that before. And it, that's very, very impressive if that's what you're doing with the funds. Because what, what often happens is that the money just goes into the flying training organisation's bank account and is spent on, essentially on the students that are flying yeah. at the time. But if it's, if it's real escrow, that's it's, fantastic. So, let me not mislead you then. So it's, not, it's a type of escrow. So effectively, we do not recognise any of that revenue until the flight training has been completed so we don't so we are not spending your money on providing someone else's training in plain terms Sheldon you were coming yeah I think in terms of protecting your money as well there's quite a few there's a number of other things you can do um, when it comes to sort of carrying out your due diligence especially with UK ATOs you can just go on a company's house and, uh, and print off a copy of their accounts and they'll tell you what kind of shape their balance sheets are in you know, like I said to you earlier on, there's never been a better time to apply for a job as an airline pilot, but ATOs are transitioning through very unsecure times right now. Uh, I mentioned that I've been in this industry for 14 years, something like six significant flight schools have gone bust. So absolutely do your due diligence. If you get an opportunity, visit the flight school, see how many airplanes are on the deck, if it's a you know, clear VFR um, day. Um, just have a quick look around to see how many students are around. But I think more importantly, Ask the organisation for a one or a two page summary current balance sheet of what kind of shape they're in. Um, so just moving on to um, funding pilot training. I think it's a great time to get into professional pilot training. But since I've started, the cost of our course is pretty much doubled. On average, I think it's around about £100,000. So it's a big ticket number to train to become a professional pilot. But if 
I'm just addressing all the sort of like parents in the room. If you've if if you've if you back your son or your daughter, they'll get through professional pilot training and they'll get a job. Average career earnings, anything between five to six million pounds over the course of their careers. So the return on that one hundred thousand pounds investment, I think, is very significant, in which case one could look upon your investment as a bit of a drop in the ocean. I know it's a lot of money. In terms of ways and means with which you can fund training, there are some organisations out there. We work with one, actually, uh, that specifically offer unsecured funding for professional pilot training. So this is an application where somebody, I'm focusing on yourself here, sir, they will, they will evaluate as to whether or not they're going to lend you money based on your experience credit score, how old you are, what you're currently doing for a living. And you can borrow up to 50% of the course fees with us, unsecured. And there's also a loan holiday of 17 months. So this is a relatively unique relationship that we've, we've got with one um, unsecured funding organisation in London. There's another thing you folks might want to do when it comes out to going out and talking to your independent financial advisors. And we work with an organisation in London that look at really real funky ways of extracting money out of properties. So I'll give you one example. We've got one student that's in training right now. He borrowed £95,000. Granny and granddad are retired and their house is paid for. They were able to take out a primary loan of £100,000 against granny and granddad's house. The money was given to the student. He's in training, so he's happy. Granny and granddad are not paying anything back and they've not had to move out their house. All it's doing is compounding interest on the loan. So everyone's a winner. Granny and granddad have contributed towards their grandson getting into pilot training. The kids in pilot training, we've got a great student, everybody's a winner. Now when this student finishes training, at a time that's right for him, he's gonna start drawing the loan down at a rate of about 10% a year. So there are different ways that creative organizations can fund professional pilot training. Great, sure. my thank you. Uh, Rob, uh, any, any thoughts on this or uh, on funding? On um, <laughs> the funding side, in the helicopter world, it's very few and far between, and I'd be very careful if, you, if you're... I mean, it's, it's a bit like British Airways, so not that I'm from a fixed-wing background, but um, there are not many sponsorships out there, and they're probably, let's say, offshore side of it. You're at level 6, 8 a year, something like that, maybe and it's not for that many years either so it might be they've, they've filled their requirement for the next four or five years so from a funding point of view i'm afraid the, the majority of people are looking at the parents or something like this or selling houses or whatever but the return on it as sheldon said is is very good i was glad that i did this 30 odd years ago um and i self-funded it now what we're trying to do at castle air is we're trying to help people along the way so um, we've pretty much mirrored, mirrored what uh, Skyborne have done. We're trying to protect the money because we don't want to be in a situation that um, we've, if for whatever reason somebody wants to leave, they, they, we're going to have to take this, we can't supply this money. So our accountants are looking at ring fencing this in the same process of you. We're also not taking money up front, so I'd be very careful with that. Um, we're doing five payments, same kind of thing, deposits. Um, and so on. But from a finance point of view, I think um, you're pretty much on your own out there. There are clever ways of, do, of doing it, possibly. Um, you can do it a modular route, which Sheldon touched on, Alex, is a method of doing it. But um, we're trying to assist people along the way. So we're looking at ways of sponsorship to make it cheaper for you. Because um, fixed wing and rotary, <laughs> we're doing pretty much the same courses, but some of the aircraft we fly are very expensive. So when you get to doing a twin engine instrument rating, our aircraft are sort of two and a half thousand pound an hour. So it's a bit different than doing it in a Cessna 152 or something. So when they get to the instrument stage, in the, in the helicopter world, you're not really that fantastically employable with a CPL. You may get a job, but nowadays it's everybody wants somebody to have an instrument rating, which in itself is probably a 60,000 pound outlay. So we're sort of, 85 grand for a CPL, but if you want integrated, but if you want the instrument rating and then twin engine on the top, you're probably up around 140,000 pounds. So it's a big outlay, but we're looking at sponsoring people that if we get the right student through, we'll sponsor them for a flight instructor because as somebody mentioned there's a, the industry tends to have a shortage of flight instructors because it is the most buoyant time I've seen in 
20 something years. There's no military pilots coming out now. So they're not filling the jobs, police, air ambulance, and those kind of things, or rigs. So the rigs are looking for people and taking them on with 250 hours, which hasn't happened before. So we're looking at sponsoring flight instructors. We'll bond, bond somebody, but they won't have to put that money up front, or instrument ratings, and maybe work for us for two or three years, and they'll get paid for that. Um, and so we're in-house in looking at trying to do this to help, because there's not a lot from our industry that's coming right. from that point Robert, of view. Thank you so much. Yeah, look, that's great. Um, look, as a general observation, and I've been part of cadet programmes for over 25 years, this, and I would support the observations that are being made, this is an absolutely splendid time. The recovery from COVID, the airlines returning to funded programmes, people having access to finance, however they do it. And what I will say is calibrate the fact that the industry has always has a need for when you graduate for about at least six months in normal times to get into employment, to start getting that return on investment. It may be quicker, it may be slightly longer, but without doubt from my own experience, the calibration, it is a fantastic time at the moment. It really is. And we had a guest speaker last night from EasyJet who said this is the best they've known it. So to give you encouragement, if you're going to do it, get on with it. And by the way, that guest speaker was the chief operating officer of EasyJet, so you would hope he actually knows what he's talking we about would like on that subject so. as well. Yeah. Thank you very much to our panel and thank you to Anthony. Thank you to all of you. We've had so many amazing questions. I'm sorry we've not been able to even really scratch the surface that much, but I'm hoping that the answers that you've got have been really, really helpful. Um, one question I saw came in, it didn't get upvoted, but had I been in an upvoting situation, I would have made sure it did. And it was, if you were in the audience, what would the question be that you would be asking? So I think you should probably be asking those questions of the exhibitors as you go around the stands this afternoon. What question would they say you should be asking to get your research done complete? So um, that, that, was, that was a good question, just didn't rise to the top. As I mentioned, the, B, the, the BA Speedbird Pilot Academy question, BA is speaking this afternoon, I will get them to answer that then, but also you can go and speak to them on stand um, and, and ask that question and ask all the ATOs how your application would stand out. Um, that's a really good question. We need to wind up in here. Thank you very much indeed. If I could ask you to leave through this door here, please be careful as you leave. Use the handrail down the side. Uh, the panel members will be back on their various stands, so please, rather than collaring them here, meet them back on their stands to ask more questions. Uh, we are back in here at 12.15 with EasyJet, and there is a talk, a sponsored talk, in um, the London suite, which is on the ground floor, at 11.35 with Airline Selection Partnership. That's on a first-come, first-served basis from a seat perspective. But remember, everything is being recorded. You will be sent a link after today so that you can watch it all back on demand. So if you miss something, don't worry. Spend your time talking to people face-to-face -face today, I think. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Have the, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.